coming out tonight for our educational forum on uh, medical marijuana. Reminder that it's only water in, in this room, thank you very much. And there are index cards under your seats for you to uh, write down questions for the Q&A portion of our uh, program this evening. There are also contact information cards under your seats. We encourage you to fill out those contact information cards and turn them in at the end of the evening. Someone will, uh, some lucky person will win a $50 gift certificate to the Ouija's or the uh, testing booth. Before we continue with our panelists, I'd like to uh, introduce a couple of uh, special guests that are with us uh, this evening. We have uh, Sarah Cross, who's the school resource officer. Sarah, thank you so much for coming out today. Sarah, you're out here out there somewhere. Thank you, Sarah. We also have uh, Megan Richards, the Senior Deputy School Resource, Resource Officer, with us tonight as well. Thank you very much, uh, Megan. Also, uh, Kathy Strickler and the uh, DAD group, Devils Against uh, Drinking and Drugs, and we'll hear from them later this evening. Thank you very much for coming out. Also, I'd like to introduce from the uh, Eagle River Youth Coalition, our host this evening, Candace uh, Golden Hogan. Candace. Thank you for all that you've done helping us put this together this evening. And also our executive director at the Eagle River Youth Coalition, Michelle Hartel, who would like to uh, say a couple of words before we go this evening. Just want to thank you all for. <laughs> want to thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, like Tony mentioned, we were really eager to bring the community together around this topic of medical, medical marijuana. Uh, we are honored to be uh, in the presence of a couple of professionals who have some data to share on how youth behaviors have shifted over the past couple of years. At the Eagle River Youth Coalition, one of our big goals is to assess youth behaviors and to mobilize the community around priority needs. And so we're looking forward to unveiling some data in the spring through about 2,400 student surveys we did over the past two months uh, to share some information on Eagle County Middle School and High School youth behavior. Uh, tonight, again, an opportunity for candid conversation about medical marijuana and marijuana in general, uh, particularly among youth in the community. I uh, also want to acknowledge all of our partners in the community that were able to reach out to us and with us in helping to put this together this evening, including law enforcement, politicians, medical practitioners, students, parents, and even dispensary owners. So thank you all very much for being here this evening for this conversation. And also want to thank uh, Tony Moore of KZYR for being here as our moderator tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And I want to give you a short overview on how the evening uh, will work. Uh, I want to reiterate that this is an educational forum designed to give community members facts. This is, uh, this is not a political debate, so we don't want to turn this into a political debate. I do want to remind you again that uh, you can get a note card. You can come up with a question in the course of the presentation, so please write the questions on the index card. We will randomly draw from the question cards and try to get, as, get to as many of those as we can. <coughs> by the end of the evening. The contact information card is for your name and email or mail address if you'd like to copy of the PowerPoint or other information that may come up as uh, follow-up requests this evening. Make sure you turn in those contact information cards so you can win that uh, dinner Luigi's or the uh, Dusty Boot. And after our guests have spoken, the uh, Dan group will address the group and the Eagle Review Youth Coalition will take a couple minutes to collect your index and information cards. So that will be the flow of the evening. Right now, I would like to uh, introduce our three guests. We have uh, Colorado Attorney General John Southers with us this evening. Thank you, John. We also have Eagle Colorado's own Dr. Drew Warner. Dr. Drew, and we have Under Sheriff Mike McWilliams joining us this evening. And uh, Colorado Attorney General, General uh, John Southers, if you like to begin this evening. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tony, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming tonight, and thanks for the invitation uh, to join me. I appreciate the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the history of medical marijuana in Colorado, where we are today, how we got there, and why myself and many others are concerned about Colorado's public policy direction and its impact on the health and welfare of our youth. Eleven years ago, uh, in November of 2000, uh, the citizens of Colorado passed an amendment to the state constitution called Amendment 20. It was placed on the ballot as a result of a citizen initiative. 
I was there in 2000 and, and was part of the debate, and I remember it well. The proponents of Amendment 20 were primarily advocates uh, for uh, marijuana legalization. Uh, but they thought that a full legalization campaign in 2000 was premature, and they were content to take a camel's nose in the tent approach by advocating for medical marijuana. That's what most of the proponents told me at the time. There were, of course, a few advocates of Amendment 20 who were true believers and convinced that marijuana did, in fact, have medicinal benefits. The proponents ran TV ads showing wheelchair-bound uh, patients uh, who indicated marijuana was the only medication that helped them. No money was spent in opposition, and the initiative passed by 54 to 46 percent of the margin. In hindsight, I think it's interesting to look back at the limited nature of Amendment 20. Contrary to the suggestion of the marijuana industry in Colorado today, Amendment 20 did not contemplate a marijuana industry. It simply created an affirmative defense to enforcement of the state criminal laws for anyone who possessed the amount of marijuana allowed by the Constitution if they had written authorization from a doctor who said they had a debilitating medical condition and medical marijuana may help that condition. Debilitating conditions included cancer, HIV, glaucoma, uh, and chronic and severe pain. People with such debilitating conditions could grow their own limited quantities of marijuana or have a primary caregiver grow it for them. The primary caregiver was one who, in the words of the Constitution, quote, had significant responsibility for the welfare of the patient, unquote. Obviously, this written authorization from a doctor is not a prescription because marijuana was then and remains now a controlled substance on the federal level. Under Amendment 20, the Colorado Health Department set up a registry. Patients and caregivers would be registered, but their identity would be protected from public scrutiny. Because of the requirement that a caregiver has significant responsibility for the welfare of the patient, the Colorado Health Department uh, immediately set up a guideline that no caregiver could have more than five patients. Interestingly enough, over the next six years, things proceeded without much controversy. By the end of 2007, there were approximately 1,700 patients on the reg registry. About half of them indicated they grew their own marijuana, and the other half said they had a caregiver. The Department of Health indicates that no one complained of a lack of access to medical marijuana. But beginning in 2008, things changed dramatically. Marijuana advocates made a challenge to the health department's guidelines alleging that a limitation of patients per caregiver had to be done by rulemaking and not by guidelines. A court agreed and the State Board of Health held a public hearing on the issue. Frankly, it's clear in hindsight that the board was not well prepared for what transpired. Over a thousand marijuana advocates showed up and after a 12-hour hearing, the board voted four to three not to place a limit on the number of patients per caregiver. About the same time, in early 2009, after Barack Obama had been elected President of the United States, the Department of Justice issued a memo to federal law enforcement saying that while possession and use of marijuana remained a violation of federal law, federal law enforcement was directed not to use its limited resources to prosecute persons who were in strict compliance with state medical marijuana laws. The combination of these two things emboldened marijuana advocates in Colorado. Very quickly, dispensaries began to spring, uh, spring up, claiming to be a caregiver for hundreds, if not thousands, of patients. Where did the patients come from? Well, through aggressive advertising, the dispensaries claiming to be caregivers created them. They offered on-site doctors who would provide authorizations, and you could get a couple months' supply of marijuana as part of a package deal. By January of 2010, the medical marijuana rolls had, in Colorado had swelled to over 60,000. Um, yet only 15 doctors had given 76% of the 60,000 recommendations, and five doctors had given half of those recommendations. Interestingly, of the 15, the majority had previously lost their DEA authorization due to prescription drug abuse and were not allowed to prescribe medicine. As a result of what had transpired, everyone looked to the Colorado Legislature in 2010, in the 2010 session, to resolve the problem. A coalition of law enforcement, drug treatment counselors, and health care providers 
were formed to advocate to the legislature to simply impose a statutory limitation on the number of patients per caregiver and return to the grow your own model initially envisioned by Amendment 20. I, but by this time, we had a very well-funded marijuana uh, industry. Denver and Boulder liberals were heads of the House and Senate Judiciary Committees. And unfortunately, in my opinion, this is my personal opinion, uh, there was no leadership on the issue from the then government. As a result, the heavily lobbied legislature voted to statutorily embrace a dispensary model for distribution. This is despite the fact that the only court decisions in Colorado at that point had reaffirmed that Amendment 20 simply created an affirmative defense of the federal prosecution, and there was not a state constitutional right to use marijuana. The new scheme cre uh, creating statutorily sanctioned dispensaries had opt-out provisions allowing local government bodies or the citizens of those local government entities to opt out and ban marijuana dispensaries. And over the last couple of years, the battle has moved to local governments. Frankly, a surprising number of cities and counties have banned dispensaries. Uh, but they're still in the neighborhood, I believe, about uh, eight to 900 dispensaries in the state at the present time. As of 60 days ago, Colorado had almost 130,000 medical marijuana patients. That's declined somewhat in the last 60 days as people have not renewed their cards. Interestingly enough, the demographic profile of medical <coughs> marijuana patients indicates that about 70% of them are male. The average age is around 40, and the median age is 33. This, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is the precise profile of recreational drug users in Colorado. Um, and of course, is nothing near the demographic profile of Colorado residents with debilitating medical conditions. 99% of the patients cite as at least one of their debilitating conditions, uh, chronic pain. Uh, just my personal opinion based on uh, my observations, I would suggest that probably only 1 to 2% of the medical marijuana patients in Colorado actually have a uh, debilitating medical condition. Uh. We now have a medical marijuana regulatory authority in the Department of Revenue in Colorado. It includes up to 70 enforcement officers, larger than the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. As you can sense uh, from my remarks, uh, in my opinion, the medical marijuana regime in Colorado, as it currently exists, uh, is uh, a state-sanctioned fraud on the part of thousands of patients and a few dozen doctors, all in violation of federal law. Not surprisingly, Where did the, the general for? marijuana industry is State. moving towards a ballot initiative in 2012 that would legalize marijuana use for anyone over 21 and most significantly retain the dispensary system for distribution. Now speaking of federal law, as you may know, the United States Department of Justice has changed its tone somewhat. Uh, when they sent out the original memo called the Ogden Memo in early 2009, uh, they apparently did not envision large grow operations and large-scale distribution through dispensaries. Uh, it's my opinion that they are now trying to discourage other states from adopting a Colorado-like dispensary law. The Obama administration is now seeing the consequences of state recognition of medical marijuana and doesn't want to be responsible for the return to drug use levels in America that we had 30 years ago. And that leads me to the ultimate question, why should we care? Uh, I would suggest we should care because I believe the adverse consequences of legalization of marijuana or de facto legalization through widespread distribution of medical marijuana will far outweigh the benefits in terms of social cost. And that belief stems largely from my concerns about the impact of marijuana use on adolescents. We know from decades of experience that adolescent use of marijuana is a function of two things, accessibility and acceptability. Marijuana has always been highly accessible to our adolescents, but medical marijuana dispensaries on, uh, some, on virtually every street corner of some sections of our urban areas have taken that to a new level. Medical marijuana patients are now the primary source of, of marijuana for adolescents in the state. Oh. The Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment indicates the number of persons between 12 and 25 who used the marijuana in the past year in Colorado was now 38.5%. Uh, 
a full 10% above the national average. The widespread use of medical marijuana has also uh, significantly impacted the acceptability of the drug to adolescents. By acceptability, I mean the perception of risk. When the perception of the risk of the drug decreases, teenage use increases. I hope you look at the handout that we supplied from the National Institute of Health. It shows the clear relationship over three decades between teenage marijuana use and perceived risk. And alarmingly, after a 10-year decrease in teenage marijuana use, we are now seeing significant increases which correspond to the decreased perception of risk. In 2009 alone, daily marijuana <coughs> use among 8th, 10th, and 12th graders increased over 10%. It was up 16% among 8th graders. This should be of no surprise. When, <coughs> when Alaska decriminalized marijuana use for adults in the uh, 1970s, teenage use of the drug increased tremendously twice the national average. <coughs> Today, Alaska has the highest per capita use of illicit, highest per capita rate of illicit use, of drug use in the United States. So why is increased teenage use of the drug such a problem? Ladies and gentlemen, in 1979, when marijuana use was at an all-time high in the United States, the average THC potency was uh, 2 to 2.5%. Two in 2009, the average THC potency was around 10%. I'm going to, uh, of course, defer to Dr. Werner to talk about the, uh, uh, the medical impacts or the, the impacts of uh, marijuana in the brain. But we have provided to you a handout provided uh, prepared by Dr. Bertha Mattis at the Harvard Medical School about the impact of marijuana on the brain, particularly the adolescent brain. And the consequences are dramatic in terms of language, memory, motor coordination, and other learning skills. It also indicates marijuana is much more addictive than many people think, particularly for adolescents. According to a report released by the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University in the last couple of months, one in four Americans who begin using drugs before age 18 become addicts, compared with one in 25 who begin using after age 21. <coughs> Marijuana legalization advocates talk about the cost of law enforcement efforts and the tax revenue benefits for government from legalization. In my opinion, theirs is what I call blindside economics. They won't come close to accurately describing the true cost of increased drug use that will come from legalization. In Colorado alone, in the 2010-2011 school year, we had a 34% increase in school expulsions and suspensions due to marijuana distribution and use. This comes on top of significant increases the year before. How much does the high school dropout problem cost us? The estimate's about $200 billion per year nationally uh, in lost productivity and tax revenue. High school dropouts produce higher public assistance costs, health care costs, and criminal activity costs. Tax revenues will not fix that problem. Keep in mind that the revenue generated by alcohol uh, sales covers only one-tenth of the social costs that stem from alcohol abuse. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've made significant criminal justice reforms in Colorado over the last uh, several years. We've significantly reduced sentences for drug use and possession. The fact is, no one goes to prison for first-time drug use or possession in Colorado. They're deferred to drug courts. Those that go to prison for drug possession have either pled down for major trafficking offenses or serious property or violent crimes. And please never forget that 90% of Coloradans in drug and alcohol treatment are there by court referral. They did not walk in off the street. They were ordered to get treatment by the court. I agree with the marijuana legalization proponents that drug use is a health problem. But I disagree with their conclusion that law enforcement cannot and should not play a beneficial role in reducing the problem. I believe that increased emphasis on drug prevention and treatment combined and in concert with consistent law enforcement deterrent is the best approach. While we should consider how the legal deterrent can be most effective, I don't think we should abandon it. Survey after survey shows that a surprisingly large number of people, including young people, are deterred from drug use because of its legal status. And it's my personal opinion, if, if, if we're going to legalize marijuana 
use in Colorado, as medicine or otherwise, a dispensary distribution model is wholly appropriate. All indications are that it increases adolescent access to the drug and perhaps, more importantly, decreases their perception of the risk of the drug when, in fact, the risk of the drug to adolescents is very significant. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. As a reminder, you've been given those uh, note cards. So please, put any questions you may have on the note cards, and Candace will pick them up throughout the evening. Please write legibly because I have to read them. Thank you very much. Then we'll move on to our uh, next uh, panelist, Dr. Drew Warner. Uh, what the research says about uh, marijuana on the adolescent brain and body. Dr. Drew. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, do I need to talk? Can people hear me if I speak loudly? Yes. Yeah. People okay? Okay. So I have been a uh, family doc in the community for about 12 years now and have had children that have grown up and have been raised in this community. And part of what I want to talk about are the facts of how marijuana can affect the adolescent. So what I want to focus on is, and hopefully some people can see this, are really the facts and not the controversy. Um, there are some proponents of medical marijuana that will never be convinced otherwise, and there are some people who are against it that will never be convinced otherwise. But tonight, at the end of my um, PowerPoint, there are a number of references, and they come from the National Institute of Health, the Federal Drug Administration, and uh, other federal and state agencies. So I'm hoping you'll see that uh, as we move forward, this is what happens when adolescents use marijuana. Uh, the numbers are uh, here. There's 159,000 medical marijuana applications. Uh, and as Attorney General said, about 68% of the cardholders are uh, male. The average age is 42. But I think it's important to note that if you look at the demographics of medical marijuana cardholders, the single largest demographic are males between the age of 19 and 29. It's also very interesting that the largest demographic of people who are the fewest seekers of medical care are also males aged 19 to 29. Men in that age group simply don't have medical problems that frequently require medical care. They don't need routine physicals, and they generally don't have a lot of things that go wrong. They tend to be young and healthy. But they're also the largest numbers of medical marijuana cardholders. 94% of cardholders have chronic pain. And if uh, you look at a medical marijuana application that a physician has to sign, a diagnosis has to be made. And one of those diagnoses is chronic pain. Uh, currently, there are about 1,000 medical marijuana cardholders uh, in Eagle County. So the question I have is, just taking the demographics, think of yourself and think of the people you know. How many 42-year-old men do you know that need medication for management of chronic pain? Most of them. Yeah, most of them. Uh -huh. I guess. <laughs> Lots. Have you heard of them? In, in July of 2011, the federal government uh, reaffirmed a statute that uh, listed marijuana as a Schedule I drug. So the government, the FDA, have a number of schedules that allow physicians to prescribe medications. Those schedules range from two to four, and they vary by degree of uh, how addictive and how risky a substance is. There are some non-scheduled medications, and uh, for example, metformin or a beta blocker, something to treat diabetes or high blood pressure, we wouldn't be here talking about it. It's not a drug that is uh, putting people at risk and not a drug of abuse. But this is the definition of a Schedule I medication. It's a substance that has a high potential for abuse. It has no currently accepted medical use in treatment in the United States. And there is a lack of accepted safety for the use of the drug under any type of medical supervision. So that is our current federal statute regarding marijuana. But they have it's a Schedule I drug, and what that means is that as a physician, I cannot prescribe it. It also means that a pharmacy cannot dispense it. If a pharmacy were to dispense it, 
it would be illegal, the pharmacy would be shut down because they would be acting against the FDA. And that's where this whole idea of a medical marijuana dispensary came up because it doesn't really allow the use of what would be prescription medication. It's all about our kids. And so I'm hoping people here can think about that and what it means. And we'll talk about how medical marijuana affects children. All substance abuse involves health risks. And it's important to think about it that those risks can occur long before drug addiction. Like alcohol and other drugs, even its first use can result in tragic consequences. In addition, uh, well-established uh, research has shown that adolescence is a very critical period of neurodevelopmental uh, vulnerability for developing addictions. The age at first use of marijuana is inversely <coughs> correlated with how addicting it is. So the younger that someone is exposed to or uses marijuana, the more likely they are to become addicted. With respect to the neurodevelopmental vulnerability, I want you to think about this. Uh, adults have well-developed and well-established patterns of how our brains work. Part of those important patterns involve how we seek pleasure. So think about the adult that wants to take up snowboarding for the first time. Typically, an adult will take up snowboarding, take some lessons, learn how to snowboard, reach a certain level of proficiency, and stop there and enjoy snowboarding for a long time. Now think of a young person that takes up snowboarding. Again, they're having their pleasure centers developed. They tend to be much bigger risk takers. They get pleasure from some of those risks. So they go out and they snowboard for the first time and they find it pleasurable and that's great. The next thing they do is they go off a jump. And that's a little bit better. They've reinforced those pleasure pathways. Now they're running through the half pipe and they're taking more risks and they're building those pleasure pathways much differently than adults do. In the same way, medical marijuana or any type of marijuana affects the adolescent brain. So once it's used, it alters those pleasure-seeking pathways in the brain. Now marijuana provides the pleasure rather than any sort of intrinsic type of reward. Like other things in the adolescent period, that same level of marijuana becomes insufficient to satisfy the pleasure centers. More marijuana is sought, and then this leads to eventually the use of other stronger and more potent drugs. Estimates from research indicate about 9% of all users, just taking everyone, uh, that uh, use marijuana and become addicted to it. And that's roughly the same as alcohol, about 10%. Um, the number increases amongst those who start young. The younger you start, the more likely you are to be addicted. And young people, meaning those under the age of 18, the risk of addiction is about 17%. And daily users, 25 to 50%. When we look at teens that uh, end up in treatment for drug and substance abuse, it's uh, estimated that a primary diagnosis of marijuana dependence is more common than that for all other illicit drugs combined. In fact, 62% of teenagers in drug treatment are actually dependent on marijuana. As the Attorney General said, street marijuana it used to contain 2 to 5 percent THC. THC is the ingredient in marijuana that has the psychoactive effects. Medical marijuana can contain up to 65 percent THC. Never before has marijuana been easier to consume. It can be smoked, you can drink it as a liquid, and it can be eaten in a whole variety of forms. What does this mean? It really means that it's easier for young people to ingest. In summary then, like with any medication, we have to look at the risks and the benefits. Every time I recommend anything to a patient, I have to see which outweighs which. What are the benefits of medical marijuana? It's controversial. According to the FDA, it remains a Schedule I drug with no accepted medical use. Because of that, according to federal laws, possession and use continues to be a federal crime. What are the risks of medical marijuana? 
Well, the dispensaries that are not well regulated uh, have vastly increased the availability of marijuana in our community. Oh. You may not know this, but when someone receives a medical marijuana card, there is no control over how much marijuana that person is able to uh, both procure or purchase, That's a lot. and there's very little control of the strength of that marijuana that they're actually receiving. So this becomes dangerous to our children because more exposure is going to lead to more use. Marijuana remains addictive, especially to the pediatric brain. Mm. And marijuana use alters the neurodevelopmental growth as they continue to seek more pleasure from drugs than they do from intrinsic rewards. The risk of marijuana also occurs the very first time that it's used. My references are available, and I'll be happy to take questions when uh, we we'll finish with our talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Drew. Again, if you have any questions, we have those uh, cards available for you. You can write down your questions, and uh, Candace will be picking those up uh, throughout the evening. We'll uh, get to our Q&A section uh, following our uh, next panelist, who is under share of uh, Mike McWilliams. Mike will be discussing the local issues. Details on what he and the sheriff's office are experiencing, perspective on change in attitude of our kids, and talking with, uh, about the school impact on uh, this issue. Mike? Thanks, Tony. A gentleman wrote a letter to the editor of the paper today, and he talked about fear mongering and asked people not to show up at our discussion tonight. Last week, six Eagle County Middle School kids were cited for using marijuana at school. I understand the source of the marijuana is still under investigation. However, one kid admitted to using pot at school several times in the past year. I believe that any use of my altering substance, whether it's marijuana, alcohol, cocaine, cigarettes, prescription pain pills, or huffing pain fumes, is detrimental to learning at the school. There are statistics quoted on both sides of the marijuana use debate. However, I believe we are here because we all care about our kids and we want to learn what we can do to keep them safer in the future. So thank you all for being here. I uh, need to say a disclaimer, the Eagle County Sheriff's Office was invited by the Youth Coalition to discuss use of marijuana. We do not have an opinion either way regarding the future growth concerning medical marijuana in the town of Eagle or any other location in Eagle County. The Eagle County Sheriff's Office has two school resource officers, Deputy uh, Megan Richards is stationed at Battle Mountain High School, Deputy Tad Deegans at Eagle Valley High School. They also handle the middle and elementary schools that feed into those high schools, as well as the liaison with private schools in the area. The SROs work closely with school administrators and staff to deal with criminal violations in the school, and this includes drug use by the students. First time marijuana offenses usually are dealt with by school administrators with suspensions for the students involved, as well as restrictions of athletic involvement. The SRO disposes of the illegal drugs. Harder drugs, such as cocaine and methamphetamine, are dealt with more severely. Repeated violations of marijuana laws result in criminal charges and more serious school consequences. The SROs try to interview students about the source of their marijuana. Unfortunately, peer pressure gets in the way, and the kids often tell the SRO, the school administrator, and their parents that they do not want to snitch or narc on their friends. They also talk about possible retaliation against them. In the last several months, kids that did talk to the SROs about the source of their marijuana have been stating a connection to medical marijuana dispensaries. This is corroborated by finding packaging consistent with dispensaries in their position, possession. Street dealers do not mark their packages with brand names of their product, and they do not normally use any kind of heat seal to package their products. Normally, there is no dispensary name on packaging for follow-up investigations. Students have told SROs that other students at the high school that have already turned 18 years old or ex-students that have graduated can obtain medical marijuana registration cards and then sell high-grade marijuana at the schools or off campus. Students have admitted to also shoulder tapping customers at the dispensaries to buy products from them. 
Some parents may say it's only marijuana and that they use marijuana in high school and they don't see any problem with it. Unfortunately, the marijuana um, from 20 years ago had the tetrahydrocannabinol or THC, the active ingredient in the marijuana, level about 2 to 4 percent. As we've talked about here, custom growing and genetic engineering of marijuana has resulted in THC levels of over 20 percent today. This means marijuana is a much more potent drug than ever before. Some products are called couch lock and warn the customer that they will be inactive for a period of time after smoking the drugs. Another concern for juveniles in Eagle County is marijuana infused products. These include brownies, cookies, butter, ice cream, hand lotions, and all kinds of food products. The products are required to have marijuana warning labels on them at the point of sale. However, it is easy to remove the packaging and consume the marijuana products in front of school administrators or parents without their knowledge of the drug inside. <coughs> in fairness to the local dispensaries in Eagle County, I have been with the Colorado Medical Marijuana investigators as they've, as they've conducted compliance checks on some of the dispensaries. The dispensaries have been in compliance with the complex laws regulating their businesses. Everything from how to grow the plants, how to dispose of the waste, transport the products, videotape all transactions, to security and storage issues is regulated by state law. A new 73-page updated regulations document just came out that they're going to have to um, be cognizant of. The state of Colorado is also trying to tighten up the doctor-patient relationships with future registration cardholders. There are 909 registered patients in Eagle County. This is about 1% of the current 89,000 valid registration ID cards. Statewide, as we've talked about, 94% of the patients claim severe pain as the qualifying debilitating medical condition. And as we talked about, males make up 68% of, of the registered patients with an average age of 41. Currently, 41 patients statewide are minors under the age of 18. No Colorado general funds, taxpayer money is spent on medical marijuana program. These are collected to pay for the administration of the program. On my days off in summer, I take inmate work crews out and have them pick up trash on the BLM and floor service member. I talk to the inmates during lunch. I've heard them say they cannot wait to get out of jail and apply for medical marijuana card. I've asked them what's wrong with them that they need medical marijuana. They laugh and say they will make something up. I hope that the tighter restrictions will help avoid the situation in the future. In Eagle County, we have been fortunate to have several trained drug recognition experts or DRE officers. They are specifically trained police officers and sheriff deputies that have been certified as experts in recognizing the effects of drugs on the human body. If an officer pulls over a suspected drug driver and there are no indications of alcohol impairment, such as blowing zeros on a metoxalizer, the officer can then call out a DRE to evaluate the driver. This is done with signs such as pupil size, blood pressure, pulse, burns on the tongue, and other indicators. The DRE then makes the decision on the driver's status. The driver is then requested to submit to a blood or urine sample to verify the findings of the DRE. The Youth Coalition does regular surveys of high school students in Eagle County concerning their use of alcohol and drugs as well as other items. According to surveys of very high school students by the Youth Coalition in 2009, about 22% of all high school students used marijuana in the last 30 days. Broken out by grade level, that's about 10% of the freshmen and 30% of the seniors use marijuana in the last 30 days. Male use is higher than female, and these numbers are higher than the national average of American high school students. The Youth Coalition survey also asked students how hard it would be to get marijuana. 36% of them <coughs> thought it would be very easy to obtain marijuana if they wanted to. I understand that a new survey by the Youth Coalition is coming out in the spring of 2012. They do it every two years. It will be interesting to see if there's an increase in marijuana use in that survey. 
So why is marijuana use abused by use at work? The study was conducted by the Drug Strategies and Police Foundation of Police Chiefs across the United States in 2004. The majority of police chiefs, 67%, rate drug abuse as an extremely or quite serious problem in their communities. While only a small minority of the chiefs describe the threat of terrorism, 17%, or violent crime, 18%, in those same terms. And according to the Arrestee Drug Abuse Monitoring, this Adam 2 program, found that the median percentage of male arrestees who tested positive in 10 Adam 2 cities for any of 10 drugs, including cocaine, marijuana, methamphetamine, opiates, and PCP, was 67.6%. The study interviewed and drug tested the arrestees who were brought into county jails for the study. So two-thirds of the people brought in to the county jails were high at the time they committed the crimes they were arrested for. My experience talking to inmates at the Eagle County Detention Facility is fairly close with those numbers. The cost to taxpayers for drug enforcement is very high. The National Drug Control Budget for fiscal year 2011 was a total of $15.5 billion. Of that amount, $3.8 billion was spent on treatment, $1.7 billion on prevention, $3.9 billion for domestic drug enforcement, $2.3 billion for international drug enforcement, and $3.7 billion for interdiction. So overall, 64% was spent on supply reduction and 36% on demand reduction. Some statistics from the Eagle County Sheriff's Office so far in 2011. 76 people were cited for possession of marijuana. 14 of those were juveniles in school. 144 people were cited for possession of drug paraphernalia. 11 of those were juveniles in school. Four people were arrested for marijuana distribution. And 26 people were cited for driving under the influence of drugs. In 2011, of the 26 people that were cited for DUID, driving under the influence of drugs, 19 of them were marijuana impaired. That's 73% of the driving under the influence of drug cases where marijuana was the drug use. In 2010, 65% of the drivers were under the influence of marijuana. Oh. <coughs> Misdemeanor and petty offense crimes, such as possession of small amounts of marijuana and pot pipes, are written summonses <coughs> and not brought to the jail. Eagle County deputies are given some officer discretion to charge or not charge on these crimes. And another deputy can witness the first deputy destroy the marijuana or paraphernalia that charges are not being filed. Felony marijuana charges such as cultivation and distribution rarely, if ever, result in jail or prison sentences. Suspects are almost always placed on probation. One newer program that appears to be having success in Eagle County is uh, County Court Judge Sullivan's AISP, or Alcohol Intensive Supervised Probation. This program gives first-time drug and alcohol violators an intensive program instead of jail time. Suspects often get out of jail and get into the same environment as friends and end up reoffending. This program attempts to break that cycle. The county jail also brings in alcoholic anonymous, narcotics anonymous programs to attempt to help break addictions. And restorative justice programs at the jail are also helping inmates understand that criminal actions have consequences for their victims. I read in an American Journal of Psychiatry article today um, that was written in August of 2011. A group of doctors from the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center is studying the connection between heavy marijuana use and suicide. Oh. In the article they wrote, the associations between marijuana use and mental illness are numerous. In the United States, marijuana is the most frequently abused illicit substance with over 16.7 million Americans reporting past month use. And it is identified as a primary substance abuse and 17% of substance treatment admissions. Approximately 2% of this state's population is now registered to use medical marijuana. And on a per capita basis, Colorado has twice as many medical marijuana users as California. 
Medical marijuana registration is highest in Colorado ski counties where median income and education levels are highest. There's a growing concern that frequent marijuana use is associated with suicide. This is especially concerning in Colorado where the Colorado Department of Public Health recorded 940 suicides in 2009. That's a suicide rate of 18.4 deaths per 100,000 residents. The highest rate in Colorado since 1988, nearly twice the national average. Amendment 20 does not require a laboratory, mental, physical, or other examination, only a physician's signature indicating that the user has a debilitating medical condition that may be alleviated by the medical use of marijuana. The article goes on to state the medical marijuana industry, a system that encourages chronic and frequent use of marijuana, has expanded dramatically, and the ways in which this development will alter patterns of marijuana use and abuse remains unclear. From my personal experiences as a detective in this county for 22 years, I've investigated several juvenile deaths. This includes suicides by hanging, gunshots, and exposure to the element. It also includes accidental deaths by skiing to trees and buildings. And this includes star athletes and honor roll kids. Autopsies were performed on all of them, and the common item in almost all of their toxicology reports was THC or marijuana use. Oh, can I positively state wow. that marijuana killed these kids? No. no. I cannot. But the fact that it was there bothers me. <laughs> Under the Reagan presidency, there was an anti-drug program that said, just say no to drugs. The later commercials were the fried egg and the statement, this is your brain on drugs. They may have been corny, but I believe that education campaigns about not using drugs can be effective. Studies have shown that keeping kids off of drugs until age 18 dramatically lowers their chances of getting addicted to harder drugs later in life. Thank you for your attendance tonight. Please contact me if I can be of any assistance. Thank you, Under Sheriff Michael Williams. We appreciate your time very much. We're going to take a minute or two to collect all of our questions. Get our uh, question and answer session underway here in a few minutes. But in the interim, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. O'Brien to come up and make a few remarks from Dad, which is uh, Devils Against Drinking and Drugs. You want to go to this one later? How you guys doing? I'm up from Broncos. <laughs> okay, welcome. Uh, my name is Rick Romano, obviously, and uh, I'm the Vice President of Devils Against Drinking and Drugs. And um, I'd like you guys to meet some of our members. Roberto Cortez, nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. Really don't care about 
whether it be athletics or school. And that's not true with everybody, but we've seen it in quite a few of our students. And some, with some students, their life starts to circle around marijuana. And it's really hard as a student with a bunch of friends who actually do it to see one of your friends just totally change over the course of time. And um, marijuana is definitely a gateway drug. You know, you used to see one of, the, one of your friends or one of your buddies in the hall, yeah, I tried marijuana this week. Oh, okay. You know, you're kind of out of your head. And the next month or so, they're, they're on cocaine. You know, it's, it's kind of, you know, it is what it is, I guess, but we're just here to represent our school and what we believe. Do you guys have anything else to say? I guess we're good. Recommendation. 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 Only federal patients have prescriptions. Thank you. Um, so this young man is Chaz, if you want to or just wave so everybody knows who you are. <laughs> and Chaz will be available. Thanks for joining us tonight, coming all the way up here. And Chaz will be available out by the resources if you'd like to learn more about his story. Uh, it's a very interesting story and, and would offer that opportunity out there. So thank you. Yeah, Chaz is having a talk right now. He'd like to like speak to you guys and he'd like to combat a lot of these you know, misperceptions that you'd have. So if you could speak, please speak to him later when he's not having an attack. He'd really like to tell you that, you know, he's not some druggie. And the real thing he really appreciates about having dispensaries this town is it provides safe access where he's not exposed, exposed to the black market dealers that he would be if there was no dispensary in town. That's the point he wanted to get across, but he'd love to talk to everyone afterwards. His attacks affect his speech. So. So it's right, not it been um, it, it, in much used drug. At the same time, that doesn't mean that some individuals may not benefit from the use of medical marijuana. Just like some drugs are used out of medication <coughs> or off labels, what we call it. But at this point right now, the federal evidence does not uh, show me enough information or enough support that I would uh, agree with the MHC. You want to check on that? As a resident in Eagle County, I have not heard much about uh, misuse of prescription drugs, meth, speed, alcohol, etc. by underage people. Why is marijuana such a focus? Thank you. Good one. Um, I would say the prevalence of it, that there's more of it. There are problems with prescription drugs, especially painkillers, oxycontin, Percocet, that type of thing. Um, we have initiated a drug take back day 
here in Eagle County to try and combat that and get those drugs out of the medicine cabinet and be destroyed. So we have less of a problem with that. Um, we have cocaine problems. We have less problems with meth than areas like Denver and Grand Junction, but it still is around. And we're having problems with heroin coming back um, through Mexico. There's more prevalence of it across the United States. But marijuana is the most prevalent next to alcohol with our teenagers. In my um, I've had the privilege, in addition to serving as the Attorney General for the last uh, seven years, I served as the United States Attorney for the District of Colorado for four years. And I served as the District Attorney in uh, Colorado Springs uh, for eight years. And I've uh, been in law enforcement uh, probably uh, about 20 three of my 35 years in, uh, in practicing law. Um, I would suggest to you that from a resource perspective, <coughs> on a local, state, and federal level, less law enforcement resources are put into marijuana than are put into methamphetamine. I've been uh, the chairman of the statewide task, task force that has spent an incredible amount of effort over the last several years uh, trying to reduce the meth epidemic in Colorado. Uh, prescription drug abuse is a horrendous problem, growing very substantially, particularly among young people. Let me give you a shattering statistic. We had more people die of prescription drug abuse in Colorado last year than traffic accidents. Um, a lot of efforts are being uh, put into that. Uh, I would suggest to you that it's not the law enforcement effort in marijuana uh, that is getting a lot of attention, but it's this uh, educational issue surrounding the dramatic increase in uh, youth use of marijuana because uh, those of us who have been in and around uh, law enforcement and drug abuse issues for years uh, know exactly what this young man's talking about. Uh, if you start smoking marijuana at a very young age, uh, the chances are very, very high. Uh, you'll not only become addicted to that, but you'll move on to these other drugs. And we know, we know that we can reduce the number of methamphetamine abusers, the number of prescription drug abusers, and uh, uh, straight across the board drug abuse if we're able to keep fewer kids from using marijuana uh, in their adolescence. We know that. That's why there's as much emphasis uh, as there's been on this uh, educational effort over the last couple of years. And frankly, I think it's just beginning because, as I indicated in my remarks, I think the uh, federal government is just beginning to tune in to the fact uh, that uh, they had visions of the states adopting these grow-your-own sorts of things when they said, uh, you know, let's, let's not mess with the state of marijuana, the marijuana laws. But now that they're seeing large grow operations, widespread distributions from dispensaries, I think they're very concerned about returning to the levels of uh, marijuana use that we had uh, in uh, 1979 to when it peaked. And I want to uh, echo something that the sheriff said. I remember we all kind of giggled uh, throughout the 80s at the Just Say No campaign. Guess what? Between uh, 1979 and 1992, uh, marijuana use in this country was reduced uh, by more than half uh, and came back to, uh, ma'am, there's a, there's a chart right in your materials that show the marijuana use. And you have to look at who did the study before you absorb a charge. Probably high. Anyway. It was actually the highest year for the mass monitor in the future, which has been going on for 40 years. Those are the NI, NIH statistics that I showed you. So anyway, uh, that's the concern. Uh, that if we have higher and higher <coughs> levels of adolescent use of marijuana, uh, we're going to have higher and higher level use of uh, uh, illicit drugs across the board. I would just like to add that I, I'm sorry that that question even came up. And I think that just is a reason why we're here tonight. It reflects a poor job that, uh, as a society, that we've done educating people about the real problem we do have with all drug abuse, uh, and not only our adults, but in our children. And if we have a hard time controlling drugs that our children abuse, 
that are already heavily regulated, what problem are we going to have when they have access to a drug that is less heavily regulated? It's non deadly. Come on, wait for Next question. Uh, how much of medical marijuana actually makes it into the hands of 18 and younger, 18 and younger group? Is there any research to, to show how that works? And how much harder is it for law enforcement to determine legal and illegal pot? Yeah. Uh -huh. I'll start on that. Um, we have an informal survey uh, by Dr. Christian Thurston at the uh, University of Denver Health Center. He has now gotten funds from NA NIH, uh, National Institute of Health, to make it a formal survey. It indicates about 70% of the kids in uh, marijuana addiction treatment in the state of Colorado indicate that their primary source of marijuana uh, is a medical marijuana patient. Uh -huh. uh, the, what was the second part of it? How much harder is it for law enforcement to determine legal versus illegal um, I think it's, it's pretty difficult. What we're, we just had a state patrol stop on I-76 a couple weeks ago uh, where there was a ton of packaged dispensary purchased uh, uh, marijuana that was in transit uh, to other states. Uh, obviously, that's illegal marijuana uh, because it's, uh, the law doesn't allow for it to be transported out of the state to, and for general uh, distribution. Uh, but, uh, you know, at a particular time, depending upon whose hands it's in, uh, if that guy's got a card, uh, it's impossible for marijuana, for uh, the law enforcement to know it's on its way to high school kids. We had an arrest of a uh, cafeteria worker at Jefferson County Schools, a 15 year old woman uh, with a, a medical marijuana card that was distributing to at least 15 kids uh, in a high school in Jefferson County. So it's, it's, it's messy. One person. Under Colorado law, to, to, for the dispensary to transport it from point A to point B, they have to apply for a transit permit through the state. And that regulates where they're going to, what route they're taking, how long it's going to take, all that stuff. So it's a little easier if we come in contact with somebody on the highway to know they're legitimate or not through the dispensary program. Um, mm -hmm. The grow operations of houses makes it a little tougher. We're running into a lot of areas where people are growing in their basement, growing in bedrooms and stuff. The neighbors call and complain about the smell. We go there, contact them. They have paperwork.